Father, we thank you for your presence once again. We, we thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would reveal these clear scriptures and these truths, God. I pray that they would go down into the depths of our hearts and transform our lives. In Jesus' precious name, your word has great power. In Jesus' name. Psalm 130, verse 1, and I'm going to be brief. That's my plan, and that, but I want it to be power-packed. I want the Lord to do a deep work in us. It says in verse 1, it says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, with you, God, there's forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So starting in verse 1, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. What I love is, is in, in times of pressure, we have options. We can either let the word of God cut us just at the tip, or we can let it go into the very core of our being. And what I love is, is when hard times come, that's where you actually get the opportunity to cultivate a deep relationship with the Lord that actually causes you to be built on bedrock. You know, the passages that Chris is referencing is in Luke chapter 6 and in, in Matthew chapter 7, that those who hear the words of the Lord and build their lives on the teachings of Jesus Christ are wise. And when the floods and the temptations and the trials of life come to that person, that person, you won't even notice that a trial came to their life because they're built on the word of God, which the Lord is our rock. If you read throughout the Psalms, I, I love it. it. I think it's in Psalm chapter 62. It, it lists a few different descriptions of the Lord. He's our rock. He's our fortress. He's our stronghold. He's our refuge. He's our place of safety. He's all these things for us. And a heart cry from me is, God, I want to experience you as these things. I don't just want to read that you're a stronghold. You have to become my stronghold. Which means when somebody insults you and you can't insult in return, when somebody hurts you and you want to respond like Christ, there's only one way to do it and it's to go hide under the shadow of the Lord and let him be your vindicator. Let him be your defender. And when you're in that place, he begins to manifest his righteous character to you and your heart begins to delight in him. And you cultivate a strength that can withstand a lot of pressure all at once coming from different angles. But it comes from this place of being tired of a superficial relationship with the Lord. And I mean daily. I mean daily when I open up the Psalms and the scripture doesn't seem open yet and I'm trying to get into it. One, I'm getting past that I just got up. And two, I'm getting past my flesh that doesn't want to be disciplined to read the scriptures. That doesn't want to be disciplined to pray. But then something from deep within, right? Because the Bible says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And many people never get past their flesh. But the scripture says that those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions of their flesh to Jesus Christ's cross and they've crucified it there. And so may we be crucified with Christ and cultivate this deep intimacy with the Lord in our spirit. It says, out of the depths I cry to you. Notice it didn't say I talked lightly to you, Lord. I cried to you in the place of trouble. If you look at Samuel and, and how he, his birth came about, it came... Not from, from Hannah having this easy time where she went into her husband and she immediately conceived and everything was rosy. Actually, it was the exact opposite of that. She was made fun of by her husband's other wife, which we're not going to debate about that one. <laughs> but that situation was going on and she was barren, which was shameful. She was bearing disgrace. She wouldn't be comforted by anything, not by drink, not by food, not by her own husband, who said, am I not better than ten sons? She wouldn't receive that comfort, but she went to the door of the, the house of the Lord. 
And she cried out to the Lord. And no, it says that she didn't even use loud words, but it was a cry from the depth of her heart to where the priest, Eli, thought that she was drunk because of how she was acting. It said that her lips were moving, but no words were coming out. He didn't hear any words. So it looked like she was drunk. But she was so overcome. Like, God, I, I want to have a child. Give me a child. And she said, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. I'll give him to you. And so the cry of her heart was answered. Now, I don't know the rest of the, the sons of that man, but I know Samuel because two books were written about this man with his name. He was a judge over Israel and he was a major blessing that the Lord used to rule over his people, a prophet of the Lord. But it was burped out of this cry, this deep cry from the heart. It says, oh, Lord, hear my voice. So many people, they think their prayers don't go above the ceiling, that when they leave their mouth, they feel like they fall flat to the floor. Well, I understand that in some measure because the scriptures tell us this. They say that the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The scriptures tell us in the book of Psalms that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear my prayer. What does that mean? If I think sin is okay in my heart, the Lord's not going to listen to my prayer. But this utter cry, oh Lord, hear my voice, will not take no for an answer. I don't care what it takes. The sin can be gone. The, uh, I'm going to crucify the flesh. This is painful. But I need my God. The scripture says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I don't know about you, but I want to be filled with the righteous character of God within my heart, touching people around my life. His cry is, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Now, mercy is something that we don't deserve. He's not coming before the Lord saying, Lord, I deserve for you to listen to my prayer. You should be listening to my prayer because of, of how righteous I am and all the good things that I've done in the past. Lord, look at how good I've been. That's not how he's appealing to the Lord. And none of us can appeal to the Lord that way. Romans chapter 3 says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God has a glorious standard. And we were born in sin. And we are corrupted by sin. But when Christ comes, he redeems us, saves us, gives us the grace of God, which transforms our life. But it's, we didn't do anything to deserve it. He gave it to us for free. That's the free gift of salvation. But this salvation is potent. It will transform your life. And that's where people get confused. I don't deserve his mercy. I don't deserve his grace. But when I received it, it transformed my life. The Bible says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation, saving all that believe. That means when the word of God goes forth and people are bound in sin, bound in addiction, under the wrath of God, the gospel message has the power to pull them out, to break the hold of sin, to break the hold of the devil on people's lives and to sanctify them and make them pure and holy. And then we get to know the Lord more and more as we study his teachings, because the scripture says that to be a true disciple, you abide in the word of God and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You know why many Christians are living in bondage today? They don't abide in the truth of the word of God. This is our daily bread. When Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, within it was, give me this day my daily bread. Now, you can look at that as natural provisions, but it's ultimately spiritual provisions. But he will also give us natural provisions. Jesus said, don't work for the food that perishes. Work for the food that, that, that brings forth fruit to eternal life. Jesus says, he is the bread of God that came down from heaven. And that anyone who eats of this bread will live and never die. You know, if you want to have sustained life in Jesus and walk with Jesus, you are going to be dependent upon receiving his bread daily, his word daily. Man shall not live on bread alone. But what is man going to live on? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Christians are famished because they're not eating of Christ. And so look at this. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And I love the progression of this song. Verse 3. If you, O Lord, 
should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, why? That you may be feared. If the Lord should mark iniquities, if the Lord should take into account all the sins that I've ever committed against him, I could not stand in the presence of the Lord and behold the face of the Lord. The scriptures tell us that God dwells in unapproachable light. No sinner is welcome in the presence of the Lord unless they're cleansed by the blood of Christ. If the Lord should mark iniquities, if he should pull up all of our records, not one of us would be able to stand before him with a face that's bold. But the scripture says that we can have boldness on the day of judgment for as he is, so are we in this world. That when he saves us and brings us into his presence, the scripture says in Colossians chapter 1 that he makes us holy and blameless and above reproach as we stand before him without a single fault. If indeed we continue rooted and grounded in the hope of the gospel and not be shifted away. Did you know something? That you can stand before God without a single fault on the merit of Jesus Christ. And what he paid for you. So when we take communion, what we did at the beginning... That is not just a ritual that we do. It is remembrance, but it's more than that. When I remember it, it's like I can receive the grace to continue walking in the freedom that Christ paid for me to walk in. You know what I love? Hebrews talks about, and I want to do a deep study on that, so I'm not trying to get too far into it tonight. But it tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, it not just forgives our sin, it purges our conscience. What does that mean? There's filth, there's flood, there's a defiled conscience that you can listen to, the, to, to, to all this crazy stuff in the world. You can watch the most violent TV show and not feel anything because it's seared. And that's why people progressively get worse and worse and worse and worse into lust is because their conscience is seared with a hot iron, as the scripture says. But when Christ comes and he purges your conscience, he cleanses it out of all of that gunk and that filth. And he gives you purity. He gives you purity to where the smallest thing, it pricks your conscience. Now, when I'm around sinners and they're doing their sinful things, that doesn't bother me. When I'm in, if I were to be engaged in sinful things, that would bother me. People can use profanity all day. It doesn't touch the core of my heart and I love them and I can smile at them and have a good time with them. But if that were to ever come out of my mouth, having been sanctified, cleansed, purged of all of the filth that was in my heart... I would feel that defiling. As Matthew chapter 15 says, whatever comes out of your mouth defiles you. And out of the treasury of the heart is why you either bring forth good or bring forth evil because of what what reservoir you have deep within your heart. But listen, I don't hear any self-justifications in this song. I hear, I need you, God. I need you. If you should mark iniquities, you know what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? It says, love keeps no record of being wronged. When we receive the forgiveness of the Lord, there is no record anymore. The Bible says he removes the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. Every foul work that we did before we came to Christ has been blotted out and it's gone forever. In the sea called forgetfulness, the scripture says that he separates our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Gone forever. Never to be remembered again. And that's why the heavens are so appalled when we have a hard time forgiving. But I would say this, it's because we don't see the deep-rooted forgiveness that God gave to us. When you see how sinful you were in the light of God's holiness, it's hard to come up with any self-justifications. You're the first one to apologize. Oh, God, I've offended you. And so when somebody offends you, oh, God, thank you. I offended you much worse than that. I can forgive them of this. To him who has been forgiven much, will love much. When you, when you realize of what you've been forgiven, it wells up within your heart, a heart of gratitude to love Jesus Christ with every fiber of your being and to love the people that he loves. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, remember all the wrong that we did, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness that you may be feared. So this forgiveness isn't something to be treated lightly. As we drink on the forgiveness of God, it's so that we may fear the Lord. Oh God, who is like you? 
Nobody would forgive me of all the wrong things that I've, that I've done, but you have. And so now I realize who I am and I realize who you are. You're the holy God from ages past of, to whom all flesh must account for the deeds done in the body. Oh, I, I fear you, Lord, and I, I see that your forgiveness and your grace toward me is abundant. And I am grateful for it. That I don't deserve it. I'm here. You're there. You dwell in the high and holy place. No flesh can stand in your presence. Think about this. Think about the Apostle John, who walked with Jesus side by side for years, laid his head on Jesus's chest. He sees Jesus in his glorified state and John hits the floor because of the majesty of Jesus Christ. On that day, I want to be in that place of holy and blameless. How, how do we get there? You repent of your sin and you put faith in Jesus Christ and you allow him to do a work in your heart. None of us are perfect. But if I were to, if I were to accept willful sin in my life, I can't enjoy fellowship with God. There's people that they begin their walk with the Lord. But because they, they're content to regard iniquity in their heart, they never even feel that deep connection with him anyway. If I regard iniquity in my heart, I can't enjoy fellowship. The Lord won't hear my prayer. That's why we need the spirit of conviction. Jesus said the world doesn't believe in me. So the spirit's going to come. And the first thing that he's going to do is convict the world of sin. Convict the world of sin. Why? They don't believe in Jesus. When they feel convicted of their sin, they got to ask, why do I feel guilty about this? Nobody told me it was wrong, but I feel wrecked and miserable over this sin that I've committed, even if they don't have that terminology. But the scripture says that the, the Lord has put eternity in every heart. That's why I understand atheists, they, they rail against the gospel. But the Bible says that only the fool says in his heart, there's no God. The Bible says that creation itself testifies there's a God. When I see the flowers, I see the tender work of the Lord. When I was thinking about this today, Caitlin sent me a video of my dog who, who passed away. And I, I thought, this might sound something to you guys, but I loved that dog. And the Lord made him. The kindest little creature that you could have ever met. The Lord made him. He made all things. He makes the cute cats. If you like them, if you don't, Zach. <laughs> But he made all these things. We see the tender work of our God. So I can see, and I've seen how he's dealt with me, and it gives me a deep conviction in my heart of the character and the nature of God. He's gentle, he's kind, he's humble. Though he's high and lofty, he's not afraid to associate with the lowly. He's not afraid to revive the, the heart of the broken and the contrite. The scripture says this in the book of Isaiah. To this one will the Lord look of him who is of a humble and a broken and a contrite heart and who trembles at the word of the Lord. That's what we're seeing here. I'm broken. I'm crying out to you, God, forgive me. Cleanse me. It's only by your mercy. But when I receive it, I fear you. I fear you. Who is like the Lord? There's no one. You are holy. You are set apart. But then he begins to reproduce that character within our hearts and lives. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. What word? There's so many promises in the scripture. And the direct context of this passage is the forgiveness of sins. In what word do you hope? That I've cried out to the Lord for forgiveness and I've seen that he forgives. Psalm chapter 51, the cry of David. My word, could you, can you take somebody who knew the Lord more than David and see the grievous sins that David committed and the Lord sent him a prophet out of love to tell him of the sins that he's committed. And David received it and he was cut to the heart. And that's where we get the cry of Psalm 51. Which if anyone is ever caught up in some sort of sin, that's the place to go. Lord, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. You know what I love about David is he didn't just want forgiven of his sin. He wanted his sin purged. He wanted to be clean because he loved the God that he sinned against. 
He took his eyes off of his relationship with the Lord. But what I love about Psalm chapter 51 Verse one, he appeals to God, not on his history with God, not on all the good things that David has done, but according to the mercy of the Lord. And when we stand before God on that day, nobody will be walking up to the Lord with pompous pride. It will all be, why are you here, Sam? And when I tell you this, I'm telling you the truth. I'm grateful for all the Lord does through my life. We're supposed to enjoy the Lord working through us and touching people around us and seeing lives transform. But what am I going to say before the Lord? Without the blood of Christ, none of that would have ever happened. Without Christ living in us, he never would have worked through us. I'm not here on my own merit. I'm here by the mercy and the grace of God and nothing else. And then the Lord, out of his deep mercy and grace, still wants to reward you for what he did through you. That is the God that we're serving I wait for the Lord. My soul, it waits. And in his word, I hope. I'm not moving off of these promises that I'm forgiven. You know, what I love is people can move on. I don't love this, but I'm going to tell you what I love. People move on too fast when they ask the Lord for forgiveness. Lord, will you forgive me of that? And they flippantly move on with no like deep cut about who you offended. David knew who God was. He knew what he had with God. And he hated that anything got in between it and he wanted rid of it. Purge me. Get this off of my conscience. Turn to Psalm chapter 32. Psalm 32. Until that conscience is clear, that heavy weight of sin makes us miserable. Until we wait upon the Lord and he lifts it. Psalm chapter 32, verse 1. Look at this. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Another translation would say, Oh, the joys of him whose sins are forgiven. Whose sin is covered or put out of sight. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Meaning, we've all committed iniquity, but the Lord doesn't remember it. He's removed it. He's put it out of his own sight because he wants to. Because he wants to have fellowship with us. The scriptures tell us in Isaiah chapter 59 that our sins had separated us from God. So the Lord loved you so much, he removed the dividing wall, the sin that was within your heart. In my heart. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Look at this, verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. When I kept silent, when I refused to confess my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. You know what Leonard Ravenhill said? He said, David had the most blessed experience in this world, conviction of sin. See, people don't view it that way, but what did it produce? It produced the fruits of righteousness. It purged every bit of filth out of his conscience, out of his life. Look at this. Does he sound happier while he's bearing this load or when he's free? I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess. I will speak to the Lord my transgression. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Another translation would say this, and I love this. You forgave the guilt of my sin. See, when you commit sin and you allow yourself to to leave sin in your life, there's a guilt that comes with it. And when the Spirit of the Lord, He puts His finger on it, when He convicts the world of sin, it's not so He can make the world miserable as if there's no hope, but His mercy says, I'm going to make you miserable now in hopes you'll repent, and then the blessing will come after. In the book of Acts, what do we see? After repentance comes times of refreshing from the presence of God. It's the mercy of the Lord, the kindness of the Lord that what? Leads us to repentance. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion, the scripture says. Therefore, let everyone who is godly, we all confess godliness here, let everyone who's godly, Offer prayer to God at a time when he may be found. Because there's a time coming when he will no longer be found when we're gone. 
Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Look at this, verse seven. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I want that to be the testimony of my life. The Lord preserved me from trouble. He preserved me from going back into sin. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 5 that believers are held in the hand of the Lord and the evil one cannot touch him. The context is going off into sin. We are protected by the Lord from the snares of the evil one that we might not be led astray from our godliness. I, lo I love this scripture in Psalm chapter 63. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. I cling to the Lord with every fiber of my being as I know how, but ultimately it's his hand that's holding me because he sees my willingness to be his, to be exclusively his, to not touch what's unclean, but to bring myself out of that place and to offer my members to God as a servant of righteousness for the glory of God. Back to Psalm 130. My soul waits for the Lord. And in his word, I hope my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning with that eagerness that they can't wait till the morning comes. That's how I am in waiting for the Lord to come. Verse seven, O Israel, O people of God, hope in the Lord. If our hope's been in anything else, Everything else that you could put your hope in in this present world will fade away. It will. But what I love about the scripture is in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says that we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's unfading. It will never pass away and it's reserved for us in heaven. Christ is our hope. The scripture says he's the hope of all nations. He's the desire of all nations. O Israel, O people of God, hope in the Lord. Why? For with the Lord there's steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption. There is room at the cross for every single one of us to come and receive new life in Christ to be transformed into a new creature. If anyone be in Christ, the scripture says this. That means if anyone has come to know the Lord and has experienced the life of the Lord and the Holy Spirit lives within them, he is a new creature. The old life is gone. The new life has come. That is the hope of the gospel. That though Saul went around killing Christians, he became an apostle and started churches and preached the gospel and died a martyr. Praise God. I saw a quote today. Fascinating. This is what the gospel does. It takes Paul to heaven with the people he killed. Fascinating. And people will say, well, is that fair? The, no, it's not. The whole point is the gospel's not fair. We're missing something. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is God in the flesh. God in the flesh. We're talking about the same God that wiped out Noah's day and only eight people were saved. We're talking about the same God that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not change. He only revealed his son, his, what he really wanted. And his son came, died a horrific death. The scripture says that it was God's good pleasure to crush his son. Why? Because he loves to crush his son? No, because he wanted you. Because in crushing the perfect righteous one, he could justify the filthy ones. The scripture says this, when Jesus sees what his anguish will accomplish, his soul will be satisfied. Why do we hunger for people to come to Christ? I want Christ to be satisfied with his sacrifice. It was a good, thorough sacrifice. The scriptures tell us in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats, it doesn't have the power to take away sin. What did it have the power to do? Weren't their sins covered? Yes, they were. People treat the blood of Jesus Christ as if it's the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats can leave me forgiven, but it leaves me in the same place. The blood of Jesus Christ has the power to rip out the stony, stubborn heart and put in it within the, a heart of flesh. A heart that's tender, responsive to the ways of the Lord, that actually wants relationship with the Lord and will walk in the ways of the Lord. That's what Christ has done. 
It's a better covenant built on better promises. The same promises that 2 Peter chapter 1 say enable us to partake in the divine nature of God. Doesn't the scripture say we share in the Holy Spirit? For too many years, what are we delegating the Holy Spirit to? The Holy Spirit is God. And when he comes, think about this. If God comes to live in your heart, Ephesians 3.17 says Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. If God comes to live in your heart and he didn't live there before, don't you think there might be a couple things different when he shows up and takes over the house? Don't you think like Jesus when he walked the streets and he had a zeal for his father's house? Don't you think God might come and flip up the tables of idolatry and replace it with righteousness? He will. He will. Malachi chapter 3 says this. The, the Lord whom you seek. We're all seeking the Lord, right? The Lord whom you seek, he will suddenly come to his temple. Oh, praise God. Praise God. He's coming to his temple. We're going to get to experience the Lord. But look at this. Who will be able to bear it when he comes? Because when he comes, he's going to refine you. He's going to sit as a refiner of silver. He's going to burn away the dross. He'll be like a launderer's soap. He won't leave one stain on you. His blood will purge you and make you completely white, radiant, in robes of righteousness. This is good news. This is the good news. That though I was abusive, though I was lustful, though I was angry, though I was wicked, unrighteous, hurting others, Christ came in his mercy and transformed my heart and gave me new life. How many people this year made a New Year's resolution? Not you guys, raise your hand. But think about how many people across the globe made a New Year's resolution. I don't want to be angry anymore. I want to stop drinking. I want to stop smoking. I want to stop cussing. I want to stop doing this or that or the other. And how many people have failed? Because flesh can't cast out flesh. Satan can't cast out Satan. Only Christ can purge you and make you clean and give you new life. This is much deeper than the abstaining from sin. This is the enjoying the fellowship of God daily. Having somebody you can walk with. Psalm chapter 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. That's what we're talking about. Daily, my strength doesn't come from me. It comes from God. Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's not a witty statement. He's saying, in my flesh, I am weak. But when God comes, I'm not weak anymore. We draw on the strength of God when we're weak. We can see it's God's power when we know we don't have any. And so, I just came to declare to you our utter need for God, our utter need for Jesus Christ, our utter need for His sacrifice to continually be new to us daily. So that we can walk in victory over the flesh, over sin, over temptation, over whatever would be thrown our way. With him, there's plentiful redemption. Look at this promise before Christ came. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. When it was time for Jesus to come on the scene, there were a couple things said. One. Jesus, when he comes, he will save his people from their sins. When he grew up and John the Baptist gazed upon the Son of God, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm grateful that the Lord provides. I'm grateful for all the wonderful things he does. I'm grateful that he's my loving Father. I'm grateful he does good things to me. But what was the purpose of Christ's coming? Why did he reveal his grace? To save me from my sin, which separated me from my Father. So, Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you for its power to transform the most wicked heart and make it righteous. We thank you that we don't have to walk this life alone, but we get to know you. We get to really know God, the one who's from everlasting. The one whom we will stand before on the last day. We can have peace with him now. That we can be justified just by simple childlike faith in you and have peace with you. God, from this day, do a deep work in our hearts. 
God caused many more to believe, whether we're on our jobs, whether amongst our, peer, our peers, our spheres of influence. God, may we radiate and shine as lights of the world, as the salt of the earth, as a city that's set on a hill. Have your glory in our hearts and in our lives. And in a moment of weakness, God, may we draw on your strength because we can always come to you. You're our loving Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. Who have I in heaven but you? And there is none on earth that I desire besides you. May that be the truth of our lives. Real quickly, I'm just going to pray for everybody here. Lord God, make yourself known to us. Because we could go from this place and we could try to do a bunch of good works to gain favor with you. But the scripture tells us many will do the works of the Lord and not know the Lord. You're not asking us tonight to go and do crazy things for you. The scripture says this. The half-hearted followers of the Lord, they said... Lord, what do we do that we must have eternal life? What must we do to work the works of God? Jesus says, this is the work of God. He changes, he flips it saying, you have you at the center. I have God at the center. And this is the work of God that you actually believe in him. And when you believe in him, believe me, your heart will be transformed and the works will follow. But our desire is that in our realization must be, it's his mercy that we appeal to. It's his mercy we cry out to experience tangibly. And he'll drive every bit of sin out of your heart. And he'll remove that heaviness that sin brings and replace it with burdens light. We love you, God. There's nobody like you. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen and amen. Well, let's clap for the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, Sam loves you. More importantly, Jesus loves you and First Love Church loves you. Have a blessed Thursday night.